Good evening. I'm Patricia Vanskyke, Director of the Lloyd Library and Museum in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'd like to welcome you to Every Yard Counts, making your home bird friendly with Matt Schumer. The Lloyd Library was founded in the late 1800s by three brothers, the Lloyd brothers, who conducted research and collected books from all over the world to aid their production of nature-based medicine. The resulting collection, now numbering over 150,000 books, includes rare books, historic books, and contemporary works. We're best known for our books on plants, but we also have an extensive collection on mycology, insects, and birds. In fact, this program is being offered in conjunction with our current exhibition, On the Wing, an illustrated chapter on birds. Our collections don't just sit on the shelf, shelves. They are the source for a wide scope of research. We also make it a point to connect them with critical issues of today. In keeping with that, we bring you tonight's program. Despite global conservation efforts and successes, many bird species have continued to, to decline over the past century, with an alarming loss of over 3 billion birds. Especially at risk are neotropical migrants who cover vast amounts of land and sea each year. Often we can feel overwhelmed and wonder if there's anything we can do. And it turns out there is from our own backyard and our own home. Our speaker, Matt Schumer, will show us how. Matt is the program coordinator at the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, a collaboration of nonprofit groups, businesses, state and federal government agencies, all advancing avian bird or avian conservation in Ohio. Uh, it is based at the Ohio State University in their School of Environment and Natural Resources. Matt's also the co-editor of the second Atlas of Breeding Birds in Ohio and the communications coordinator for the Association of Field Ornithologists. It's now my pleasure to introduce Matt Schumer. Hi, Thanks, Matt. Patricia. Hello, how are you? Good. Thanks for this opportunity to join you tonight and present. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that all right. Um, as Patricia said, my name is Matt Schumar. I'm the program coordinator of the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. And the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, or OBCI, is a network of organizations throughout the state of Ohio and regionally all working together to advance bird conservation. There are about 120 member organizations within the network, ranging from universities and state and federal wildlife agencies to museums and libraries and nature centers, metro parks, basically anyone interested in advancing bird conservation throughout Ohio and throughout the Americas and globally. We've worked on a number of projects to date. Um, most importantly, a lot of our work is focused around conservation planning. So we get researchers together to really look at all of the global concerns for birds and try to develop uh, recommendations and actions that we can take to conserve populations of these birds. We're right now undergoing the process of updating our all bird conservation plan. So that first plan was published in 2010 and we're just getting ready to publish an updated version of that. Out of that work that has helped us to identify a lot of key features really important to the successful conservation of birds throughout Ohio and regionally. And that comes with forest management. Um, some of that I'll talk about today because it creeps into our backyards as well. Um, we worked on with the Ohio Department of Transportation and the Ohio Ornithological Society on an American Kestrel Nest Box program on highway signs. And one program that we're really passionate about right now and working with partners throughout the state um, and with colleagues throughout the Americas is uh, an effort that we call Lights Out. There's even a Lights Out Cincinnati program. So if you're joining us locally from around the Lloyd, um, you can find out about Lights Out Cincinnati. And I'll talk a little bit about that tonight um, as we talk about some of the issues that, that birds face and what you can do. 
So you can learn more about OBCI by going to our website, obcinet.org. And I'll reference that a few times tonight because there are resources available on our website and things that you can get information on for how you can make your homes better uh, for birds and programs that you can get involved with if you're interested. So as Patricia mentioned this, we're putting all of this in the context of avian population declines. And so she mentioned the 3 billion birds. This is a report, um, basically a publication that came out in Science in 2019, documenting this massive decline in avifauna throughout the Americas. And since the 1970s, nearly 3 billion birds have been lost from our landscape. Now, this is quite alarming, um, but a lot of these trends we've known about for quite some time. And while it is a, a little bit scary to think about, um, we also can look towards exa examples of populations that have had successful um, increases due in part to a lot of the conservation effort that we've done in the past. A really great example of that are waterfowl. And so uh, because of duck hunters and things like wetland mitigation uh, regulation throughout Ohio and the United States, waterfowl populations have done incredibly well um, in the past 50 years. Um, and so this is a really great example of an approach that we can take, a, a philosophy, if you will, um, to try to get out of this crisis and get our avian populations back um, on a, an upward trend. And what we're going to talk about today is the need for this to really be a community level um, action and how you can get involved in that effort as well. So as I mentioned, they documented nearly 3 billion birds gone from the landscape since 1970. This includes 2.5 billion migratory birds. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is not just the birds uh, that you will see in your backyard all the time. So things like, you know, if you live in an urban area, you might be used to seeing house sparrows or starlings. Um, but even some of those native backyard birds, goldfinches and northern cardinal, many of those aren't the birds that are in the steepest decline. Um, we're talking about neotropical migratory birds um, that are among the most imperiled. And whether you realize it or not, a lot of these birds are using your backyards. And so we're gonna be talking about some of the things that you can do at home um, to improve your yards as habitat for a lot of these migratory birds. If you'd like more information on the research and some of the application coming out of this project, you can go to 3billionbirds.org, um, get a lot more information and find out about the research that went into um, these estimates. So we have to put all of this change um, into our landscape or in the context of our landscape. So these population changes um, are occurring at the same time that our landscape is developing rapidly or we have rapid landscape change. The map shown here on the left is from the National Land Cover Database. So this is uh, remotely sensed data from satellites um, used to identify habitats and land cover features um, on, on the ground. And what we're looking at here is the change in any type of habitat to a developed habitat. So all of these pink dots, um, we can see a little bit of a, a sprawl circle around Columbus, um, but we also see quite a bit of expansion throughout this uh, Miami Valley, as well as the uh, Northeastern Allegheny Plateau area between uh, Cleveland and uh, Akron. Um, we see some of the other communities and cities around Ohio getting developed as well. So, you know, development is happening at a rapid pace. And if we don't do that smartly or think about ways to develop the landscape in more environmentally friendly ways, we're really going to start losing significant amounts of habitat. So when we talk about that, when, we th when we're concerned about managing the land or really protecting a lot of land, we have to think about who owns the land that we're talking about. I know there's a lot of concern and people want to make sure that our parks and our state forests and national parks and national forests remain intact and unaltered, but it's really important that we look beyond that. If we're only looking at management of public lands, we're really missing most of the picture. Um, over 95% of Ohio is privately owned. So if we are going to successfully conserve habitat on the landscape, we need to work with private landowners. And so all of you joining us today um, can have a really important part in that legacy and in that management. So how do we do that? Well, first, 
we have to support scientifically informed active habitat management on public lands. With the number of people on the landscape and with the way that we've altered it over time, sometimes just leaving it the way it is or leaving it to be isn't always the best strategy. We have invasive species that we need to deal with and we have a landscape design that we have to take into consideration. So, you know, working with researchers and public agencies to actively manage these habitats can sometimes be quite crucial. Also, we have to treat all private lands as manageable habitat. And yes, seriously consider everything or treat everything as habitat. So the photograph on the bottom right here is from one of the suburbs um, here in Columbus. I'm sure it looks very similar to a lot of the suburbs or places where you live around, around your home as well. So we need to treat those as habitat as well and work with the homeowners there, work with community associations um, to make sure that we can turn these places into habitat, not only for breeding or overwintering birds, but a lot of the transient migrants that maybe just visiting us for a few days as they make their way from Central and South America um, through Canada, or excuse me, through Ohio to Boreal Canada, where they may spend a brief amount of time during the nesting season. And this really comes with shifting or a major shift in the way we think about conservation and overcoming a lot of conservation paradigms. So Partners in Flight, very similar to the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, is a consortium of state and federal wildlife agencies and other research groups throughout the Americas working together for bird conservation. They published their first comprehensive land bird conservation plan in 2004. Um, and in that first plan, there was only a single mention of migration. Almost all of the work that was being done and all the research to address these concerns were aimed at breeding habitat. The thought was, you know, we really need to take care of and preserve breeding habitat for the birds that are coming here from, from the tropics. That's only a part of the picture. And what we're learning is that may not be the bottleneck for a lot of these species populations. So Partners in Flight took um, a lot of the feedback and reassessing a lot of these population declines and published an updated uh, revision to the Canada and continental United States Conservation Plan in 2016. And they took a more holistic approach with that. So they're really embracing this concept of the full annual cycle or full life cycle conservation. So we see maybe state agencies um, not only concerned about what's going on within their state or within their region, but what might be going on throughout uh, really the entire hemisphere. So not just looking at maybe what's going on in Ohio, but what is happening for these species that occur in Ohio during some time of the year, when they're in other parts of the globe at other times of the year? Do we, can we help partners in those parts um, as well? And really thinking about the threats that birds encounter throughout this um, complex annual life cycle. So if we sort of take an example of that approach, um, one species that we could look at would be the viri. So this is a thrush. It is related to uh, the American robin that you might see in your backyard um, throughout the year, especially if you're in the Cincinnati area, you probably have a, a really great chance of seeing American robins any time of the year. Um, Viri is a neotropical migrant, so it is only nesting here in Ohio and places farther north. And the rest of the time it is either on the wing or it is overwintering in areas of South America. And so historically, you know, we may as researchers or um, state biologists may have only concerned ourselves with breeding habitat because maybe that was, we thought our presumed responsibility for this species um, as a nesting bird here. And if you take a look at the map here on the right, these are the results from the second atlas of breeding birds in Ohio. So this was a citizen science project aimed at getting bird watchers out all across the landscape in Ohio to understand where every species um, occurs during the breeding season. And so all of those brown squares that you see are the blocks in Ohio where Viri was detected during the breeding season and presumed to be breeding. Um, you can see that its breeding distribution is more restricted primarily to Northeastern Ohio. This is a boreal, primarily a boreal breeding species. So they're much more common in Canada than they are um, in places like Ohio. Um, so, you know, if you were interested in seeing a Viri, you have to seek out these 
areas in Northeastern Ohio during the breeding season. But really, you know, if you go to eBird.org, and we'll talk a little bit more about eBird tonight, this is a, a tool, a website for bird watchers to submit their observations. So it was developed as a really great way for birders to keep track of the birds that they're seeing, um, but it's evolved into this amazing um, ecological database that's now the largest um, in, in the world. And so if we take a look at, if we just pull up Viri on eBird, we're gonna get a map that looks like this. This is quite a bit different than the coverage we saw um, from the breeding bird atlas. And the main difference here is that this is for the entire calendar year. And so really there's a chance of seeing viris in Ohio anywhere from mid-April into early November because they are migratory. So we not only have the breeding birds that occur here um, during May and June and into July, but we also have transient migrants that might be just passing through um, to Canada during April, May, and then in September and October as well. So if we as conservationists, as biologists, as folks who work with us for the state and uh, federal wildlife agencies, if we are serious about conserving habitat for uh, viris, we need to not only think about those breeding habitats that might be quite specialized in Northeastern Ohio, but think about the habitat that they're using throughout the state um, during migration as well. And if we take a look at, at where they're moving across the landscape, it's pretty fascinating um, to see where they are at any given time of the year. So because eBird, um, because so many bird watchers have submitted observations and data to eBird, um, we, researchers have been able to create these really um, accurate and complex um, relative abundance maps throughout the course of a year. So what you're looking at here is the predicted, the relative abundance of viris um, every week of the year. So you can see, you know, they're not really on the breeding grounds that long. Um, they're either moving or they're spending more significant amounts of time in uh, South America. And what's really interesting, if you stare at this map long enough, um, and I encourage you to go to eBird and click on the science tab and you can see maps like this for hundreds of species. Um, and I've spent hours um, sort of staring at them and, and it really um, can evoke some interesting questions. Um, and ideas about species behavior, ecology, and potential conservation applications. But if you stare at this long enough, you may see uh, during the winter time, we, we get fairly concentrated areas that pop up in different parts of South America. So here they are in Northern South America, and then we see that little uh, area in Southern Brazil light up as well. What we've learned about these species is fascinating. If you go to any older field guide, um, you open up a book, you're going to see winter distributions that often cover large areas of ground throughout South America. They may cover most of the continent. When in fact, they're not using that entire land area throughout the entire winter. They're moving around to different parts to track resources that are available at different times um, of the year. A lot of that comes with seasonal drought and that is what's going on here with Viri. So they're actually moving across the areas of South America during the winter to track resources. Um, and the reason they come to Ohio and Canada during the breeding season is because of all those amazing resources that are available in temperate broadleaf forests during spring and summer. Um, so they're by migrating and breeding in these areas far, far away from the tropics, they're actually um, having the opportunity to increase um, their genetic success in, in, in population. Um, success. And so if we want to provide habitat for these birds on the landscape, that is where you all come in to create bird-friendly yards. And so I think for a lot of people, if you tell them that you want to help the birds, this is probably the first thing that comes to mind, putting bird feeders out. Um, but this is going to be a theme of tonight's talk. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about a lot of things that I, I hope that you will explore further. So what I want you to be asking yourselves um, as you look at your own backyard or look at other people's yards, think, is this really a bird friendly yard? And if you're seeing something like this, where there's maybe a few bird feeders out, but not a whole lot of uh, vegetation, it's probably not that friendly of a yard. And we'll talk more about why um, as we go through this evening. 
or would a bird from the yard look something like this? And this is getting closer to the ideal um, scenario of what your yard might look like if you are truly concerned about conservation of native wildlife. It's primarily filling that yard with lots of vegetation. Um, and we'll talk about what all of this can do uh, for birds um, over the, the course of the next few slides. And so that 3billionbirds.org website that we talked about early on, um, you'll find this infographic on there and, and a lot of the related websites. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, those folks that uh, run and manage uh, eBird, um, took a big part in developing these simple actions. And these are things that you can do um, as an everyday person to help protect um, and hopefully increase populations of migratory birds. And so I encourage you to go to 3billionbirds.org and get information on all of these. We are going to focus on four of these actions tonight because they are specifically aimed at protect, protecting and helping neotropical migratory birds. So making your windows safer, keeping cats indoors, using native plants and avoiding pesticides. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these things um, for the rest of the night. So that first is making windows safer. And this is a big, big part of it. If you are feeding the birds or if you're putting native plants out there, if you're not treating your windows, you're not thinking about this holistically. And so in the United States alone, up to a billion birds are killed annually by building collisions in the United States. Um, it's a pretty substantial number and it's among the highest um, threats for population declines of migratory birds. So we run, we help coordinate these lights out programs. So our Ohio lights out network consists of regional lights out programs in many cities throughout the state. And as I mentioned, we have one in Cincinnati as well. So the Cincinnati Museum Center um, is the primary organization with coordinating um, that effort. In a few of those cities, we have volunteers who help us walk around the downtown areas to look for dead and injured birds. In 2019 um, alone, so this was kind of the last year before the pandemic started that we were able to survey in full capacity, we found 4,200 birds in our surveys in just a few downtown areas of these cities. Um, so pretty staggering. But if you look at the pie chart here on the left, you'll see that only 1% of collisions are actually coming from high rise buildings. The vast majority of them are coming from low rise buildings. So a little over half are coming from low rise commercial buildings, but 44%, almost half of these collisions are coming from residences. So homes in every neighborhood um, across the United States and Canada are contributing to a, a large amount of these bird building collisions. And so if you think about that, there are, it's a lot of potential birds moving across the landscape that you may not be aware of. During spring migration, nearly 3.5 billion birds will enter the United States from the tropics. And another 2.6 billion or of those 2.6 billion are going to continue on to breeding grounds in boreal Canada. In the fall, that number is even greater. Um, and that is because there are all these baby birds in the population. So you know, birds go uh, to their nesting grounds, they may fledge young, and a lot of those uh, new young, they're making these migratory journeys for the first time. So in the fall, nearly 4 billion birds are entering the United States from um, nesting grounds in Boreal Canada, and almost 5 billion birds will leave the United States um, into Mexico, Central America, and South America to overwinter. So a lot of birds are passing through your yard that you may not even be aware of. And it turns out that migration is incredibly energetically taxing and the risk of mortality is quite high. Research from Hubbard Brook Experimental Lab, um, they've been researching black-throated blue warblers for a really long time. And they found that mortality during migration was at least 15 times higher than during breeding or overwintering. Um, and so, you know, really these migratory journeys are, are quite dangerous um, and quite risky. And the reason birds do it is because there's so much reward. Um, the food resources are so amazing um, at given times of the year, they're able to space themselves out a little bit more um, and take advantage of those resources. So although it is risky, there is or there has historically been great reward to that risk. As we continue to develop the landscape, 
that might not continue to be the case. And so we need to think about this. Are we providing really good habitat? Are we minimizing threats for birds um, as they cross the landscape to their breeding grounds and overwintering grounds? So we need to make windows safer. Um, for our lights out uh, volunteers that are walking around downtown areas, this is what they're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they're finding lots of, lots of birds, but if you look at the, the landscape design, um, it really looks like habitat to a lot of birds. Um, so the photograph on the left is a really great example of how the line between actual habitat and the perceived or reflected habitat um, can be quite blurred. Um, if you kind of had no idea what glass was, um, if you have not evolved with glass, you wouldn't understand that this is a reflection of adjacent green space. And that is where we find all of these problematic um, areas where we find lots of, of dead and injured birds is around places with large glass windows or glass facades next to green space. Um, and, and we have that all over the place. But I want to make the point, um, if you recall back to that pie chart that I showed a few slides ago, that 44% of collisions actually occur in, at folks' homes. Um, and yes, your windows are, are likely killing birds as well. You may not be aware of it. 25 to up to 50% of window collisions do not leave any evidence whatsoever. So, you know, you may have seen something on your window that looks like this, and this is uh, feather dust um, that can leave a mark if a bird hits it. This is actually less common than you would think. Um, many times birds strike windows and don't leave any marks and they're carried away quickly uh, by scavengers and predators. The photograph on the right is an Eastern chipmunk carrying away a, an American goldfinch that hit a window. And in fact, uh, chipmunks, squirrels, and even deer um, actually eat a lot of birds. And so they quickly can carry those off so that there's no evidence whatsoever um, that there is a bird collision there. So window collisions are quite common um, and you may think that your windows aren't doing anything, but in fact, um, likely birds are hitting your windows at some point. Many of you have probably seen the hawk stickers. It might be one sticker that people will put in the corner of their window. Those stickers are not very effective. To actually have effective treatment on windows, we need to break up the reflectivity as such that there is not more than a two inch vertical space or a four inch um, horizontal space basically anything larger than that, and a bird can attempt to fly through it. So if you're using those, wind, those bird decals, you really need to cover your windows with a pattern that looks like this if you're going to effectively reduce or eliminate bird collisions. That's probably not realistic for most people. We have windows for a reason because we like to see out of them, uh, but there are really great solutions that can help birds and can also allow you to see sort of unrestricted out of your windows. In fact, this is a photograph of my home um, where I've treated all of the windows um, on the back patio um, and in our sun porch um, so that I can see uh, the bird feeding station. This is with a product called Feather Friendly and we'll talk a little bit more about that and there's some information on our website about that. But basically we're just putting a small fritted dot every two to three inches um, on that window to break up that reflectivity. And so it doesn't really affect my visibility out of those windows, but it goes a long way to allowing birds to see these windows so they don't fly into them. So here's another angle, a couple different angles from that. So you can see on the left how well uh, glass can reflect surrounding vegetation, especially as it interacts with light. Um, but the photograph on the right, you can see it's not really disrupting my view of the feeding station. Um, in fact, I had my camera set up for a while. This was a really great winter where we were getting things like evening grosbeak um, and a lot of other boreal eruptives um, visiting us that I had never had at my feeders before. So um, really easy solution to put on your windows. It doesn't impact your visibility or aesthetics um, much at all, but it can really do amazing things to um, reduce or eliminate bird collisions at your home. If you're interested in learning more about glass collisions and um, things that you can do at home or products you can treat your window with, the American Bird Conservancy has an entire website and a department um, dedicated to this, um, showing you why birds hit glass, um, things you can do um, to your home and ways that you can engage your community as well, because that is another thing we need to do is make sure that we're not just doing it ourselves, but our neighbors and community leaders are doing it um, as well. So, abcbirds.org slash glass collisions, um, really great website, and they have a products database there for 
um, treating windows that already exist, um, as well as glass um, that you can put into new construction um, that has structures built into it. So the next thing I want to talk about is keeping your cats indoors. This is a really big one. And in fact, the largest threat to birds, aside from habitat loss, is predation by feral and free-ranging domestic cats. There are about 70 to 100 million feral or free-ranging cats in the United States, and they kill 1.4 to 3.7 billion birds annually, and up to nearly 21 billion mammals in the United States. So we're not just talking about rats um, or non-native species, we're talking about a lot of the native species um, that can be quite important to biodiversity and ecosystems. So it's important to keep cats indoors, not only for native wildlife, but for the cats as well. Um, cats can serve as vectors for diseases such as rabies, filarmia, hookworms, and toxoplasmosis. And TNR, which stands for trap, neuter, and release, is not an effective strategy. There's lots of research showing that TNR does not maintain or reduce populations. Um, they're often not closed populations, so there's more emigration and immigration out of these and that a lot of cat colonies will sustain or grow over time, even if they're being actively treated with TNR policies. Um, so not an effective strategy and it's not one that we, we recommend. I say this as uh, a really <laughs> heartfelt cat lover. Um, in fact, my helper was here a little bit ago and uh, I don't know where she's at right now, uh, but here she is. She often helps me uh, on a lot of these Zoom presentations and is my buddy during data entry and analysis. Um, cats can lead um, really fulfilled and enriched lives indoors. They do not need to go outside um, to have quality lives. However, if you do feel strongly about getting your cat um, some of that outdoor um, experience and really getting them a, a lot of interaction, there are things called catios that you can build um, at your home. So this is basically a screened in enclosed structure that allows the cat to get outside, but separates them from native wildlife. Um, there are lots of really great companies that make these or provide plans. So if you have the space and you really want that outdoor enrichment for your cat, I strongly suggest looking into building a catio, um, either small or large um, at your home. We have more information on our website under the resources tab for keeping cats indoors. So links to uh, research behind um, cats in the wild and things you can do um, to help um, keep cats and native wildlife safe. Okay, so we're gonna get to the one that I think most of you thought we would be spending most of tonight about, um, but really you can't only look at native plants if you're not addressing some of these other threats as well. Uh, but this is kind of probably the meat and potatoes for a lot of you or what you're really interested or things you can do for your landscaping to improve that habitat for birds. And so the big part, the big takeaway in all this is reduce lawn as much as possible and plant native vegetation. That comes in the form of grasses and sedges and flowers, but also shrubs and bushes and small trees and large trees as well. It's important to note that, again, we're losing a lot of land to development. So more than 10 million acres were converted from forest to developed land um, in the United States between 1982 and 1997. Um, and manicured lawns provide few resources um, and require significant amounts of water and chemical resources to maintain, and they do not provide food. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about some work uh, by a friend of mine, a colleague, Desiree Narango, um, who's done a lot of work in urban systems and works closely with, um, has worked with Doug Tallamy, who you may be familiar with, um, who, who really does a lot of work with native plants. Um, so the next few slides, uh, I really wanna give a shout out to Desiree and Doug for all of the work um, that they've done. If you're interested in learning more about their work um, and it, Doug has uh, published a number of books on this subject. So you can go to his website, homegrownnationalpark.org, um, and there's a tab there for Talamy's Hub where he shares information on his books and things that you can do, as well as my friend Desiree Narango. Um, that's her website there, desireenarango.weebly.com, where she shares information on her research um, and ways that you can make your homes better uh, for birds. So why natives? Um, and again, I'm going to summarize some of Desiree and Doug's work here. Uh, 
but one thing that we've known for a while that they've really um, quantified um, excellently in a lot of their recent research is it all comes down to insects. Insects are so important. So we need to make sure that we have native species that have these um, insect host relationships. More than 90% of plant eating insects are specialists. And so a great example of that, that most of you are probably very familiar with is that of the monarch butterfly and its tight association with milkweed. Turns out that that is not a special case, that more than 90% of insects, of these plant eating insects, are in fact specialists. And so we really need to make sure that the plants and trees and bushes that we're putting on the landscape are native if we want those native insects that these migratory birds have evolved with. And it uh, this is some of Doug's uh, recent uh, research published uh, just uh, last year showing that declines in insects are related to declines in insectivorous birds. So if we look at the average change per species and we see significant declines in those that are where insects are an essential part of their diet. And for those bird species that where insects are not an essential component of their diet, we don't see those declines. And so it's really crucial that we have these native plants and so they have their native uh, insect associations, which means food for birds. Um, and part of Desiree's research showed that you know, Carolina chickadees uh, was her study species for this. And she showed that Carolina chickadees preferred breeding in yards with more native plants. Nestlings grew faster and were in better condition in yards with more native plants. And Carolina chickadees fledged more young in yards with native plants. So the key takeaway there is if you want healthy chickadee populations, you have to have healthy yards with native vegetation in them. So what does that mean really? Um, how much do we need? Well, what she found was that in order to sustain healthy bird populations, you needed 70% native biomass in your yard. For if we take a quarter acre yard as sort of the average yard for that, that means you need four large trees. These are all native, seven to eight medium sized trees and 15 to 16 small shrubs or small trees. Um, so you really need a lot out there if you're going to sustain healthy bird populations. Anything less than that, and we don't see those populations sustaining at, at standard levels over time, we will see eventual declines. And so you really need to fill your yard um, with as much native plant structure as possible in order to sustain healthy bird populations. There are lots of really great options for native fruiting tree shrubs and vines. Um, some that are fantastic for birds include hackberry, persimmon, red elderberry, viburnums, uh, flowering dogwood, and Virginia creeper. Even things like poison ivy um, can be really fantastic for birds. They will forage on the fruits of poison ivy during the winter time. So I, I usually encourage people, I know it's, it's um, an allergen for a lot of people. I have strong reactions to poison ivy. So I manage it around our buildings, um, our home and our, like our shed and our garage. But if it's growing elsewhere, um, I usually leave things like poison ivy out there because it can be really great uh, cover and food for, for birds. Many of you are asking, well, how do I know if a plant is native? Here are a couple of really great resources. So you can go to the USDA, the Department of Agriculture's plant database, and that's plants.usga.gov. And the National Audubon Society also has a native plants database. So it allows you to type in your zip code and it will give you a listing of native plants. So we're not talking about just plants that are native to North America. We are talking plants that were also locally historically available as well. So trying to at least restrict it to native plants that would be in the area of Cincinnati, um, if that, that's where you're looking for. Um, really great resources. I encourage you to check those out. Um, you can look up any plant in the plants database and it'll tell you if it is native, what its historic range was, what its current range was, um, whether or not it's considered invasive or noxious and then if it's regulated at all. So really great website. Um, it's one that I check um, every so often for information about various plants. So if you go to Audubon's website and click on uh, search for a zip code. So here I've plugged in uh, zip code for the Lloyd uh, 45202 and it will bring up 
a few hundred uh, resources, um, and you can filter those by annuals and perennials, grasses, succulents, shrubs, trees, vines, um, a whole number of filters if you're looking for a particular type, type of plant. So I encourage you to check that out. It's a really great resource, and it can also tell you what types of birds might be interested or what types of birds it might attract. Um, so it's a really great tool, and um, I'm really thankful that Audubon Society has developed and shared that with everyone. Going along with that, um, avoiding pesticides as much as possible is really important. Um, it makes sense if you think about what we've been talking about for the past few slides, that insects are food and that native insects are really important to a lot of these birds. Um, you know, birds, most birds during the breeding season and during migration, at least spring migration, really require insects. They need that protein source. Usually, for many birds, they may switch to fruit diets during the winter time because it, it might be the only thing that's available, but and they're not growing as much or they're not trying to rear young. So they don't need as much protein in that. Um, so it's important that we try to reduce or eliminate pesticides as much as possible. There are times when pesticide use may be necessary if we're trying to eliminate noxious invasive plant species. Uh, but for things like maintaining lawn, get rid of pesticides, um, replace that pesticide thirsty uh, grass uh, with some, some native vegetation, and that'll go a long way. More than a billion pounds of pesticides are applied in the United States annually, and there's significant decline, concern over the declines in aerial insectivores, um, which is likely related to uh, declines in insects from pesticides such as neonicotinoids. Species I've shown here is an Eastern whippoorwill. Um, it's part of a family of birds called night jars. Um, and many of those species are declining pretty rapidly. Um, maybe for those of you who are a little bit older, may have heard whippoorwills at some point um, in your life and might have not heard them recently. Um, they've been declining quite a bit in Ohio and other parts of Northeastern United States. The map on the far right is the change map from the two breeding bird atlas projects. So. The first breeding bird atlas was conducted by bird watchers in the mid 1980s. And then the second atlas was conducted in, from 2006 through 2011. And all the yellow blocks on here are places where whippoorwills were found during the 80s, but not during the early 2000s. And so they were essentially lost from the landscape. And that is a trend that is continuing. Um, so really, only using pesticides where they're absolutely necessary to control uh, noxious invasive species, um, otherwise get rid of them. And so lastly, I wanna sort of transition to some of you who may own larger yards or potentially farms um, or small woodlots. These can be critically important. This is a map of forest connectivity throughout Ohio. So the darker colors, those dark blues and blacks are areas of larger contiguous forest. And those that are green and more towards the warmer colors like orange are small patches, basically anything less than uh, 25 acres um, down to just a couple acres. These are critically important. Um, and you can see, you know, there's a major divide here in Ohio that sort of lines up with different eco regions throughout the state. So this Appalachian portion of the state, the Ohio Hills and even the interior low plateaus here um, around the Cincinnati area have areas of large contiguous patches of forest. But as we get farther north in the states where it's primarily agriculture, um, those woodlots are much, much smaller. These woodlots are critically important for neotropical migrant birds as they're coming up from Central America. Many of them come up through the Appalachian Mountains and as they hit the Great Lakes, they start to spread out to boreal Canada. So many migrants are passing through Western Ohio and it is important that they have places to eat, basically areas where they can fill up the gas tank. Um, they're basically trying to eat as much as possible during migration to load up on fat reserves um, as they make this incredible journey a couple times a year. So if you own a small woodlot, it's critically important that you also maintain that uh, for migratory birds. So the native plants are really important. So, uh, you know, when we're talking about forest management for landowners, we really have to think about the landscape in which people live. If you're in Southern Ohio, any recommendations that we have would be quite different than say Defiance County or Cuyahoga County where the surrounding landscape might be primarily agricultural or urban suburban developed. 
And so we really need to think about those. Anything that you do should involve talking to your neighbors to understand what they're doing as well. That can be for forest management if you own a small woodlot, but it can also be for your yards as well. So you know, if you're managing your yard for healthy bird populations, try talking to your neighbors as well to get entire communities involved um, in doing this. You may never get these uncommon uh, boreal uh, or neotropical migrants, so things like cerulean warbler nesting in your backyard um, if you live in a suburban area. But many of these birds are going to use your yards for stopover habitats. American red starts, um, although they're a fairly common breeder in parts of the state, they're incredibly common as a transient migrant. So lots of red starts are sort of passing through Ohio as they move to breeding grounds farther north. So your yard can be critically important um, as a food resource, as a pit stop uh, for many of these migrants, American red starts. Rusty blackbird is another species that is of great conservation concern um, and uses a lot of places in Ohio, farm fields um, and other forest as well um, during different times of the year. Leave those yards and fence rows and everything natural over time. So you don't have to rake all your leaves up. Um, leaving brush piles out there can be really important overwintering habitat for some species. Species like Carolina wren, which are heavily impacted by severe winter weather, um, can use things like brush piles and cover. If you've got a lot of shrubs um, and cover in your yard, if you're leaving that um, throughout the year, it can be really fantastic for species like Carolina wren. Mm. Mm. If you do own a small woodlot, you know, you can only do so much with it. Um, so you may not be able to necessarily manage it for a different structure or different species, but really you can enhance it as much as possible. So thinking about the landscape context. So again, what are your neighbors doing? Um, working to do things like leave fence rows and streams forested um, so that these corridors are available for migratory birds. Um, eliminate invasive species as much as possible and really um, try to promote a lot of different structure with native plants. Limiting browse and grazing can be incredibly important. Um, and then reducing hazards adjacent to forests. So we've talked about bird collisions. You know, if you're putting all of this fantastic vegetation, trees and shrubs out in your yard, but you have a lot of windows um, on the back of your home, uh, if you're not treating those, you can create a situation where it can be a little bit of an ecological trap or you can attract birds um, to those areas uh, that would collide with your window. So if you put all this great habitat out there, make sure that you're not um, also putting threats out on the landscape. If you have a little bit of land and you want some help and assistance in managing it, there are a lot of really great free resources. So professionals will come to your, your property and look at it with you. Um, you can talk to the Division of Forestry and Division of Wildlife. They have biologists they can send out. Soil and water conservation districts, which are usually in, in many county offices throughout the state, um, as well as NRCS, they've got a, a lot of really great information. Um, but also talking to things like county park districts, um, local university extension offices can give you a lot of really great tips um, if you have a yard or if you've got a farm and you, you want to manage those for birds, um, they can be really great resources. And lastly, you know, there are lots of things we can think about for protecting bird populations into the future. And one thing that sort of goes into every ecological conversation we have is the impacts of climate change on habitat and on birds. And um, there's been a lot of research into this. And it turns out that you can manage your yard in an urban space um, to help mitigate some of the impacts, uh, potential impacts of climate change. This paper came out a couple uh, last year actually showing that um, urban forest, so small woodlots in forest can mitigate the magnitude of urban heat islands. And so uh, forests or woodlot patches with more diversity, more species re richness um, and tree canopy cover um, were cooler during spring, summer and autumn. Um, and so really it's sort of you, the trees in your yard and in your neighborhood can do a lot um, ecologically, um, not only for migratory birds, but for other wildlife as well. So if you're interested in learning more about some of the techniques you can do, you can visit our website where we have uh, guides and small virtual workshops 
on forest management um, and other resources. So check out our website there, that's obci.org. And with that, um, I would like to turn it back to Patricia and open it up for any questions that we might have. Matt, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I really learned a lot. I thought your relative abundance map was very cool. I think I'll get pretty obsessed by that. I've never heard of a catio. I'm not going to tell my cat about it. Um, and I really didn't think I had a bird collision issue. So that was pretty interesting um, that there can be no signs that that happened. Um, looks like we have a question. I see something that just, um, I'm not seeing the question though. Um, I just see something that, oh, nope. um, I guess not um, just yet. I also, it's clear that I need to add more trees and shrubs to my yard, even though I thought I had uh, a lot. Thank you, especially for the resources, because again, that will be something that we can really go back to and check. And I think that's so valuable when we have these webinars because when they're in-person programs, you're taking night notes like crazy and all of that. So we'll all be able to go back and review it, watch it on the YouTube channel, um, look at those uh, places that we wanna spend more time. Um, while we're waiting to see if there are any questions that come in, um, let me see, I think maybe one did. Yeah, it looks like you've got a couple on there. Uh, oh, um, somebody did ask um, if, um, will we send the link to the recorded video? And yes, we will be sending um, all of that out to all of the participants. So Sarah asked, any tips on where we could learn more about native pants that would encourage specialist insects to come to your yard? Yeah, um, the Audubon website will have a little bit of information on those insects, but if you really want information on, um, from an entomological point of view, uh, you really want all those species. Uh, a lot of university extension offices, like I know Ohio State University Extension has a lot of really great resources um, if you're looking for specific uh, plant and vegetation host relationships. Um, so you could go to OSU Extension's website um, and I'll share all the links that I talked about tonight in my presentation. I'll be sure to share with Patricia and Aaron um, if they want to potentially include those in the YouTube description, um, you know, I'll pass those on as well. And there are a lot of really great resources on the Ohio State University Extension, but I'll also say that Penn State University Extension and Purdue Extension are both fantastic. Um, I've often borrowed a lot of their materials for the OBCI websites. Um, we want to share all of the great work that people are doing outside of Ohio too. So um, I will say check out those university extension offices because they can be really fantastic um, for lots of information, um, really specialist stuff like plants and fungus and, and all kinds of really great, great things. So on the topic of native plants, uh, we have a question from Kate about good sources for purchasing native plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really is going to vary quite a bit depending on where you're joining us from in the state. Um, I'm not super familiar with Cincinnati, so I can't comment um, if many of you are, are local to the area, but I will say check with your local um, conservation district. So you could reach out to folks at NRCS or the Division of Wildlife and see if they have recommendations. All of those university extension offices will have really great resources as well. And many of them may link to um, local native plant sales. Um, a lot of the local Audubon chapters do as well. I know there is the Audubon of uh, Cincinnati there that um, Heather Farrington uh, was president. I don't know if she still is president or not, but um, they often provide their members and, and other people who are interested with information on native plant sales. So, those usually pop up during the spring. Um, I think late April and early May is a really popular time for a lot of those native plant sales. So 
check with your local Audubon Center, your local Audubon Club, or a local university department. They can help you out. Uh, also in Cincinnati, we have the Civic Garden Center, and they have Great. a big sale in May, I believe. Uh, yeah. So um, the folks can watch us, uh, you know, watch our website. We usually cross promote that and they often have native plants. Um, here's a question um, from Nancy about bird baths. Do you have a bird bath in your yard? I do. Um, so it's important to keep that clean. Um, you know, I, I didn't talk much about feeding uh, like bird feeders and bird baths much because that's, that's usually the default what people think of. Um, a, a bird bath is something that you could leave out all year. I generally don't recommend that people leave bird feeders out all year long because the birds don't necessarily need them. But uh, water is a great resource to keep in your yard. Um, I will say though, if it doesn't have flowing water, if it's just a, a, a bowl, to make sure that you're changing that out regularly and you are cleaning uh, the bird bath to avoid transmission of any diseases or, or to get birds sick. Great point. Uh, we have somebody that lives in a trailer park and behind her trailer park is a wooden area. Uh, mm -hmm. Wanting to know what suggestions in making a tiny area a more bird friendly environment. Well, it, first finding out who owns that tiny little area will be really important because, um, you know, if it's part of the community there, you, you may be able to talk to uh, the association or whoever's running that. Um, if they own it, they might be open to you um, helping to manage that a little bit. Um, so making sure that one, you have permission to do <laughs> whatever you're going to do with that area. And the first step what I would try to do is just try to eliminate as many of the invasive plant species as possible. There's probably lots and lots of bush honeysuckle in there and Japanese honeysuckle and oriental bittersweet and, and lots of things that can really just overtake an area. Um, a, lot of, a lot of areas are just overgrown with honeysuckle. And there's been a lot of research showing that um, nest success is quite low and that the, the Honeysuckle has lower quality fruits and they don't have any of the, those um, native insects associated with them. So the first step would really be to try to get rid of those invasive species as much as possible, um, as much as you can do by hand, but it may involve um, some chemical application at first as well, just to get out there. And then once you do that, trying to replant or recover that area, you know, with, with native vegetation, small shrubs um, as much as possible. Um, and that's, that's kind of all you have to do is just maintain healthy native plants out there. And, and that would be a great, great way to approach it. It's nice that some of the things that we have for other things like plant, plant diversity, we're talking about getting rid of honeysuckle invasive yeah. plants so that we don't, it makes sense that we're doing some of the same things for the bird population as well. So um, somebody's asking a question about planting, a neighbor of mine, in fact, um, about planting shrubs, native flowers. They, they have a large locust tree in their front yard, and okay. they're specifically uh, concerned about root blocking, digging too deep, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um... When you're in an urban area, roots are always uh, an issue as a homeowner. Um, you know, I'm, I'm joining you today from my home in Columbus, and uh, you know, our our yards are postage stamp sized, and you know, we have a huge birch tree out front and a willow along our driveway, and the willow has caused problems with rooting um, into some of the pipes, and so um, it's it can be a challenge. I don't have any great recommendations for, for dealing um, with that. Just be a little bit smart about the size of the tree that you're planting in various locations. Um, the Audubon website, and if you're talking to uh, you know your local plant center or arborist, they'll give you really good information on what the root structure of any tree is like. While oaks are amazing for neotropical migrant birds, um, many of them are seeking out oaks because of the insect relationships. Oaks have giant root systems. And so if you're in an area with that is really tight and really close neighborhoods, maybe certain types of oak trees aren't the best, um, but there are more shallow rooted trees that would be better for you. So 
talk to folks at those native plant sales, talk to your local garden center about species that one are native um, to this area, but also do well in crowded suburban areas that may have a lot of underground piping and, and things like that. We have uh, some more mentioned um, sources to go for native plants. Uh, Cincy Keystone Native Plants and the Cincinnati Great. Nature Center. Um, a question from Laura. Curious to know if there are any more insight on what was killing so many birds last year. And she talks about people yeah. being asked to take their feeders down. Yeah, so unfortunately, no. That was a really mysterious uh, thing that happened. Um, so she's referring to last year, there was a lot of sudden bird die off in the eastern United States. It wasn't just Ohio, but it was um, other neighboring states as well. There were some hypotheses as to what that might be, um, but they still haven't figured out. I know that um, USDA lab uh, has been working on that quite a bit. Um, they've ruled out a lot of viral pathogens, so it did not seem to be passed from bird to bird. Um, that's why most states kind of gave the okay again that it's fine to start uh, feeding birds again. Um, some of the hypotheses were that it was potentially related to the periodic cicada hatch, not necessarily from the cicadas themselves, but from a fungus that this particular brood was carrying. That hasn't been proven either. That's still <laughs> um, hypothetical. So nothing has really been figured, you know, resolved with that. We hope that it was not a regular occurring thing. There's no indication that we're gonna have issues with it again this year, fingers crossed that we won't. Um, my guess is that it was something like fungal um, that sort of sprouted up, but it does not seem to be viral. We don't have any issues with that. We do have an issue with avian influenza, unfortunately in Ohio this year. Um, so the highly pathogenic avian influenza has been detected in Ohio that primarily affects larger birds like waterfowl, uh, poultry, and some raptors. Um, so there are a lot of all the wildlife rehabilitation agency and groups and um, state and federal wildlife agencies are kind of keeping an eye on that, but it should not affect um, feeder birds anyway that would that would come into your backyard. So we do have another recommendation for native plants is drop right. seed nursery off I-71 just outside Louisville for native plants and seeds. And they also ship. It says worth the trip to pick it up. Excellent. Um, yeah. You maybe have already answered this as thoroughly as you can, but I will ask it just in case there's more to add to that on the subject of honeysuckle. Um, really how to get rid of it. I know you mentioned that you could use um, herbicides initially, uh, the panel or the attendee is saying that they notice when they cut it back, just grows back more the next year. Yeah, you really have to get rid of the root system in that as well. Um, and unfortunately, it's not quite as bad as uh, things like autumn olive, which will break off. So plants like autumn olive, uh, which is another invasive plant shrub species, one that we actually planted um, purposefully for uh, a long time. Um, the root system of autumn olive will just break off. So if you try to hand pull it, it'll leave the roots in the ground and that'll actually encourage it to root sprout rapidly. So you can actually exacerbate the problem by trying to hand pull species like autumn olive. Honeysuckle, that can happen, but it's not quite as bad. So for small honeysuckle plants, you can actually hand pull them. For large, like when they get to shrub and even tree size, you can't hand pull them. So what you have to do is some type of application, unfortunately, that includes an herbicide. Um, so there are a few techniques. There's um, basically cutting and stump and sort of painting the stump uh, with a gly glyphosate uh, mixture. Um, and there are some other applications. So I, actually we have a lot of this information on our website under the forest management resources. Um, so I'll be sure to follow up with Patricia to send that. So there are some videos on our website um, from these, some of these great university extension offices showing you how you can deal with uh, uh, 
things like honeysuckle and other invasives that can be sometimes almost impossible to deal with. But you're right, if you cut it, they'll just grow back. And for some of those invasives, if you cut it, it's bad. <laughs> uh, like tree of heaven, if you cut it, it just sprouts like crazy everywhere. And so if you kill one, you may have encouraged a thousand to grow. Um, so it can get tricky. We have a question about bat populations. If you aid the bat population, does that impact bird population? Um, I would say if you're doing good things for birds in general, you're probably doing good things for bats as well. Um, so leaving your yards um, as wild and as vegetated as possible. So um, actually leaving leaf litter in your yard over fall and winter can be really great um, for insects and for bats. Um, and so that's one thing you can do. We have a couple, bats have a couple of different life history strategies. So we have resident bats that will go into caves uh, at various times of the year and hibernate. And we also have migratory bats. Um, and so some of the issues that birds face like building collisions and collision with wind farms, the same thing happens with bats. Our Lights Out volunteers actually find a number of bats in their downtown survey work. Um, so things like red bat and hoary bat, which are migratory um, as well. So treating reflective surfaces can help uh, for bats as well. Um, there are some other issues, um, you know, they echolocate, so different uh, facades. Um, can confuse echolocation a little bit more, but as much as we can think about environmentally friendly landscape design for birds, it will also help bats, migratory bats as well. Well, Matt, I wanna thank you so much. And we have a lot of positive comments from the audience as well. I also really wanna thank the audience. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the most robust chat sessions we've had. Okay. So I, I, very, thank you so much both Matt and the audience. Um, all of you, please watch for more programs as part of the On the Ring, Wing series. We'll be addressing more conservation issues, focusing on the role of technology, social justice, and photography. Um, and as we mentioned that this will be appearing on our YouTube channel. So um, please visit it and share the recordings with folks that may not have been able to come tonight. If you're in the Cincinnati region or planning a trip to Cincinnati, maybe even you, Matt, right? Yes. <laughs> Visit uh, the On the Wing exhibition. It runs through June 18th. And I also would like to mention that tonight's program is supported by memberships and donations to the Lloyd. And if you're interested in becoming a member or making a donation, visit our website, lloydlibrary.org Lloyd and click on support. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thanks everyone.